I think uh, you'll find that uh, my remarks build uh, very much on what uh, uh, Steve uh, Steve had to say, and because uh, I'll also be talking about question four mainly about the, uh, the linkage to f between financial stability and, and monetary policy. Uh, this is a standard disclaimer. Oh, I, I want to thank uh, uh, Ron Feldman, Terry Fitzgerald, Sam Schulhofer Wool, and Kamu Yi for their comments. And I think Sam and, and Kamu are in the room, so you can ask them questions instead of me. Um, so, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to talk about monetary policy and financial stability. Um, I see this as uh, both a, a transitional and a long term issue in the monetary policy conversation. Um, the basic pr issue is easy monetary policy is seen as potentially creating risks of financial instability. And, uh, you know, my, my view is that uh, it's preferable to mitigate such risk as much as we can using supervisory tools, sort of a, 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 what's sometimes referred to as a separation principle. But in reality, supervision, supervision may be imperfect and it may leave us with residual systemic risk. Uh, how should this uh, residual risk affect monetary policy? So in this talk, what I'm going to do, in, uh, I'm going to present a, a, a very simple framework to incorporate systemic risk mitigation into monetary policy making. And my, my theme is going to be that systemic risk creates a mean variance trade-off for policy. And so I can see some familiar faces from a, a talk I gave in New York at the end of last month. And this first part of the talk will be uh, very similar to what I, what I gave in New York. And I'll, but I'll close with a, what I, I will, I'll refer to as a suggestive calculation. Uh, suggestive is meant as a term other than definitive, uh, as, as you'll see when I get there. That's the outline. So let me talk about a mean variance framework. So the monetary policymaker's goal is going to be to set some kind of gap equal to zero. You can think about this gap as being inflation minus the target, or you could think about it as being uh, the uh, natural unemployment rate uh, minus the actual unemployment rate. Uh, the basic, uh, 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 the key here though is X is actually based on macroeconomic outcomes. It goes back to whatever the mandate is for the, uh, in terms of the macroeconomy uh, uh, of, the, of the central bank. And that's going to uh, mean that there's an additional complicated step beyond what Steve was talking about. What Steve was talking about is, is important, subtle enough, but we have to, going to have to go beyond that to making linkages between that to what's going to happen to the macroeconomy. But I'll, I'll talk more about that when I get there. Uh, the monetary policymaker has the ability to alter uh, accommodation. I'll, I'll treat that very abstractly by uh, cha changing this variable A. And X, the, the, the gap, is increasing in A. Um, after the, the issue for the monetary policymaker, one issue is that uh, there's a lag. And after you choose your level of accommodation, the, the, the gap is, could be affected by a number of shocks uh, be, that, that are outside your control, in including uh, shocks to the financial system. So the loss for the central banker uh, is going to be very traditionally given by the square of the gap. Um, and uh, this is just a way, I think, a very standard way to um, capture the idea of the monetary policymaker wants that gap to equal zero and also uh, capture a, a notion of symmetry, that the, the, the central banker views, the policymaker views a, a gap that's negative and po or positive as equally bad. So, but the issue for the central banker, or as again, one of the issues, is that X depends on the shocks that are realized after accommodation is chosen. And so uh, the monetary policymaker has to have some way to, to integrate across all the various uh, possible states of the world that it could occur. I'm just going to use the, the mean, uh, I think, pretty naturally. And so the, the central banker is going to be, the monetary policymaker is going to be choosing a level of accommodation to minimize the mean loss associated with, with A. Now, so the usual approach here is that the mean loss, we can break this up, and this, this is just a standard statistic, or uh, freely probability. The mean loss is equal to two components, the squared mean gap plus uh, the variance of the gap. And, uh, you know, this basic idea is it's a question of, it's a, uh, it's a uh, sum of two things, how close you are on average, squared, plus how much you fluctuate, fluctuate around that average. And that's, uh, that's, that's what you're trying to minimize, the sum of both of those components. Now, the typical assumption that's made 
um, in, in this kind of analysis that uh, the central bankers would make is that as a monetary policymaker, you can't influ influence the variance of the shocks that could be impacting you. You're making your choice A of accommodation. There's going to be some shocks hit you after the making that choice in terms of how they impact the target, uh, excuse me, the, 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 the gap, but you, don't, you can't influence that variance. So that assumption means that minimizing expected loss is really the same as just minimizing the squared mean gap, minimizing the first component in that sum. You're taking that fluctuations around what, what, uh, whatever you choose as, as the mean is given. Uh, you're just going to try to get as close as possible. And in fact, the solution now becomes simply to choose a level of accommodation that eliminates the gap on average. You know, ex post, of course, could be uh, higher than uh, inflation could be higher than two percent or lower than two percent if that's your target. But on average, it, it's going to equal zero. Now, okay, so all of this is sort of the standard way to do things. No financial stability component. Now I'm going to talk about incorporating the financial stability risks. So, you know, this is a very uh, abstract compared to, and uh, to do this right, you're going to want to build, integrate the kind of work that uh, Steve was talking about. And uh, I was at Brookings yesterday, saw a very nice paper by uh, Gabriel uh, Schroeder Reich, also trying to get after very similar issues to what Steve was getting at about uh, how does monetary policy affect measures of financial stability. But really then you're going to want to get to do another step, which is how does that financial instability that's being measured, how does that go on to measure, uh, affect X, which is, as I said, in terms of macroeconomic outcomes like, uh, um, um, uh, like unemployment and inflation. But let's suppose, and it's easy to do because we can just write this down, that higher A increases the risk of financial instability um, and uh, that, that will lower uh, your, your, your gap. Lowers uh, lowers uh, inflation, for example, or, or raises uh, uh, actual unemployment. Then the, this higher A is going to increase the variance. Now you can affect the variance, the wiggles, the, the fluctuations around your, your chosen mean. And now you face a trade-off. You're going to trade off the, the squared, uh, how close you are on average to, 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 to getting the gap equal to zero uh, uh, with uh, minimizing the, the fluctuations around that. Now, the trade-off is going to mean that you're going to be willing to give up on somewhat on getting the gap equal to zero. And in particular, you're going to be willing to, uh, on average, have the gap be, be negative under appropriate policy. And that's because you're willing to give a little bit of some mean. I'm prejudging my own um, uh, judgments about how this will work. But you'll, you'll give up some mean. We know that in order to get less risk in A. But of course, the key question is the quantitative one in the last bullet, how much mean exactly? That inequality at the very top there tells you nothing really of interest because less than zero is not that interesting. It could be a number like 1 times 10 to the minus 50, and then we, we, we just give up on, on thinking about this. You actually have to know how much mean of, on the gap are you willing to give up in order to get lower variance, the appropriate amount of lower variance. So if you want to compare two monetary policy alternatives here, you're going to choose A over A star. And if you remember, A star got rid of the mean totally. It got averaged the gap equal to zero. You'll choose A over A star which, uh, if you A reduces risk sufficiently. So the, the, the reduction in variance associated with choosing A, which is on the left-hand side, is greater than the risk, excuse me, the, the, the squared mean uh, in, the, in the gap associated with choosing A, a, a which is on the right-hand side. Now, Central bankers, you know, know a lot about assessing uh, right-hand side. Uh, it's a choice. <laughs> you know, it's still a lot of uh, work to be done. It's not an easy problem by any means. But we know that's what we sp uh, our staff spent a lot of energy on uh, uh, trying to do that, figuring out the mean of X, mean of the our, our projection of of the gap, given our choice of accommodation. And I, I, I'll add here, but. You know, I've certainly made this clear this week. Uh, the right-hand side remains large for current choices of, of A. So any question is about the, the left-hand side, how do we assess the difference in the risk implied by um, policy choices? How do we do go about doing that, that left-hand side? I'm not going to say, be, uh, against, I'm going to be staying very abstract given uh, uh, where, where I am in my thinking. But the, the, uh, here's one simplification that could be helpful, I think. Suppose we just think that the, a crisis of some kind causes the gap to fall by some large amount delta. And suppose that the monetary accommodation implies that the probability of a crisis is P of A. So now we're simplifying 
the size of the crisis, the impact of the crisis doesn't depend on your choice of accommodation anymore. All it does affect, depend on that is the probability of the crisis. Now, with some statistical dependence assumptions, which I'll, I'll, I'll wave my hands over, the variant difference, the difference in the variance is just going to be the difference in the probabilities of the crisis taking place multiplied by the square of this, of this gap uh, increase delta. So now, this is somewhat simplifies our problem to uh, uh, hopefully we won't have a crisis in terms of time. That would be, be bad. But uh, uh, <laughs> guidance, yeah. <laughs> given any policy choice A over A star, uh, we need to assess the pro implied probability of a crisis and its impact delta on X. And so the first piece of that, I think, is really going through the kind of work that Steve was describing. And then the second piece is worked, further work to be done about how, how, does, uh, um, how does that crisis end up depending on delta. Here's my bit. I mean, I, I wanted to put lots of adverbs before this, but I was convinced it was, uh, it was overly wordy. But this is super highly suggestive calculation is what I, I, I want to be, be saying. So you know, assume that the natural unemployment rate in the United States is about 5% in 2017, um, three years from now. And that under current policy, pro the projected unemployment is also about 5%. So that is. Under uh, current policy, we, 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 we successfully eliminated the, the, the unemployment gap. So I'm going to ignore the inflation gap just for the purposes of exposition here. Now, but suppose you, if you had a financial crisis, it would be very bad uh, for unemployment. It would generate unemployment of 9%. So this is the idea here is the impact of that crisis is, uh, is large. It's generating a uh, four percentage point increase in, in unemployment. Now, how likely is a crisis? And this is where the, the, ten, the suggestive and uh, highly suggestive nature of this comes in. Suppose we looked at the survey of professional forecasters, which is a survey that's done every, every quarter by the, the Philly Fed. The Philly Fed uh, forecast, the average survey of professional forecasters um, for, a prediction is that the probability of the unemployment rate being that high in 2017 is 0.29%. So that tells you that the probability of a crisis that's going to raise unemployment by that much, by four percentage points, is even less than that. Because there are presumably other causes, potential causes, of, of having such a high unemployment rate. OK. Now suppose we had a utopian uh, monetary policy, implausible monetary policy, I would say, that actually could eliminate any chance of a crisis. So it puts P of A prime equal to zero, gets rid of the crisis completely. So uh, this goes through some calculations. It's not 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 not, not important. The, the 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 key point is going to be we do, can now do this difference between P of A star, which is uh, 0.29 percent, P of A prime is zero, and we're going a little negative here, and uh, and that. So the basic point is just going to be that the you're only going to choose this tighter monetary policy to to eliminate all crises. If that tighter monetary policy lower raises your projected unemployment rate to less than 5.22 percent, so a very you're willing to tolerate a very small increment in the unemployment rate that you get, and that's because the current current survey of professional forecasters forecasts say that the probability of having such a tail event in the unemployment rate is so small. That's where it's coming from. It's saying that going as high as four percentage points is only 0.29 percent. Conclusions. I, I'll just go to the. The key, I'll just go to the key measurement issue. What's the probability of a crisis? And I went off the survey of professional forecasters, and those guys are paid to forecast, but they, they might well not be being paid to forecast the probabilities of tail events. So you could easily imagine that they're not, they're not uh, uh, engaging probabilities of tail events as effectively as we would like. So we want to have other uh, ways to, to, to develop assessments at probability assessments of tail events. Uh, models, I think, are certainly a guide. And a lot of work we're doing at the Minneapolis Fed is trying to get after actually financial market-based probability assessments of, of tail events. Thank you very much.